Okay, let's take a look at all this. Um, well, it was made clear to me that my camera is too low. Uh, <laughs> no, that uh, I made an error, and you know, I vaguely remember noting that something was missing in my head. Um, what it is is uh, blah, blah, blah. somewhere here on page five. If you have, uh, I know what the rule is because it was told to me, but I'm having a hard time finding it in this mess that is the rules. Uh, if you end up passing, yeah, here it is. Uh, each action that your opponent takes after you've passed is going to cost an additional resource of any type that has to be paid before the before the action plays out, which prevents something like I saw in say the last turn, where you know Sparta was kind of doing things and spending prestige to do stuff, but it was a little iffy whether they really wanted to or not. And honestly, I don't think um, I don't think it had a whole lot of effect on the overall outcome. But it certainly makes, um, when somebody's advantaged enough that they have a lot remaining that they could do, uh, pay more of a penalty for that and maybe not choose uh, to take the advantage that they've gained themselves uh, as extremely. So anyway, uh, I quit early. I cheated. I played the rules a little wrong. <laughs> And another, a number of other things, so what the hell, uh, you know, right do I have to judge the game? Well, the right I have is that I've looked at it enough and I've come to some conclusions, uh, at least that apply for me, which is that this is far too um, obscured, obfuscated uh, of a design. There's no real... Uh, there's no real link between what it's trying to portray in some way and the realities on the ground. The, the trade system is not realistic. The combat is not realistic. That's all fine. I don't mind heavily abstracted games, but they should be kind of intuitive then, right? And if a game is a pure abstract, which I'm almost tempted to say this is, you know, because that lack of... That, that level of abstraction and lack of intuitive connection uh, ends up saying to me, okay, so this is just a model to compile certain points into certain other points and generate them. Well, when you get to that, for my tastes, uh, and this is a problem I have with the Euros that started coming out a little before this, I think, uh, but then it's become really a habit in the Euro community sort of the serious Euro players, are into games that are trying to obscure what you're trying to do and how to play the game properly, <laughs> you know? That becomes the goal of the game, is figure out what the strategy is that is kind of key. And there may be more than one. There, there may well be in this. I can see multiple different patterns here. To some extent, you need to do that. You can't have the game just all laying in front of you. But I feel like the modern Euros have taken this far too far, for my tastes at least, where, you know, it takes several plays to start to understand the game. You know, you can make the same argument about Go without knowing anything but the rules of Go. I went for years probably having more fun, though, <laughs> than I ever did once I started kind of studying Go in terms of playing Go. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, that naive play. I don't enjoy the naive play here. I don't feel like I understand what I'm even aiming towards in this game. Yes, I know there's this pile of victory points that consists of my prestige, my population, and leftover prestige points and whatnot that I've generated through the game. Um, but without 
you know, a real grasp, what I saw the first time I played, which is not on video, was a grab for territory can kind of lose you the game. You know, <laughs> getting a lot of allies doesn't help you because you got to feed them all. <laughs> you become somehow responsible for feeding all of the members of your coalition. I don't find that at all believable or realistic. And again, you know, uh, Athens was not required to make sure that everybody had food. They maybe made money off of the trade that was involved in making sure that nations that were responsible for feeding themselves did so. <laughs> but <laughs> it wasn't a matter that Athens uh, was responsible for forcing that as a government or whatever. And likewise with Sparta. So much of this game feels like I'm managing things that as that power's leader or whatever, I don't have any influence on. And again, I'm okay with that kind of thing, but I'm not okay with the fact that you've made it so obscure and so difficult for me uh, to process those actions easily. I find things with a lot more rules, like after the Holocaust, easier to approach. And Equally, you know, I mean, that, that has a system that survival is very difficult in, right? But it's clear why it's difficult. <laughs> you see right away, I've got to produce the food. I've got to do this. I, here, I felt like there's this gauze between me and what the game's trying to represent and how I'm trying to win it, and it's deliberately put there um, to make the first few plays... Uh, maybe more revelatory or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> because if it is a deep enough game that some people seem to assure me that it is, that it doesn't, um, you know, that there are many, many different combinations to reach towards, more emphasis, I feel, should be put into making it easy to do the easy stuff, right? Of course, you can't change the design based on that, but you could change how the rules are expressed. And how the rules are expressed is one hell of a problem. So why did I miss a rule? Why did I walk away without an idea of what the fuck I'm doing in the game? Well, it's because the rules don't do a good job of, of expressing that. First of all, missing a rule is really the format of the rules. And how much can I complain? Well, it's a Euro format. Lots of pictures, lots of examples. Not a lot of really clear, you do this, you do that. Um, it's also written in a procedural basis. So like in uh, a coin game, I have to try to figure out which of this whole list of actions are actually valuable under any given circumstance and why they exist and everything. And that's a layer of difficulty that in the coin series is painful enough. But when you take the simpler coin games like Andy and Abyss, you get kind of a flow into that. I don't feel like, um, maybe I'm just not aware, that there's something that leads to this, that I should, you play this first. I gotta tell you, I wouldn't want to play um, um, Pendragon or, I don't know what the Germanic and Kavon is. Got the expansion sitting here. So I should should be able to tell. Falling sky. Um, I I wouldn't suggest playing one of them first. Uh, I would suggest going for one of the earlier coin games to get used to that mechanism. Likewise, I wouldn't suggest jumping into um, one of the heaviest CDGs without seeing how that mechanism kind of works to begin with. And maybe you could say the same of, dude, you're just not ready for heavy euros. And that may be the case. Um, maybe, and I suspect this is the case, I will never be ready for them. Because I've taken my cracks at them. And some, uh, some things that got classified as heavy, things like brass, felt fairly easy to me. Uh, 
Indonesia felt fairly easy to me. It felt like they intuitively linked to what I'm trying to do. Brass is a little bit more of a point salad thing. I enjoyed it, but whatever. But I'm finding it very difficult to make the move uh, even to simpler euros that are more of this flavor. And I, I don't know how to, how to find that uh, distinction. Um, like I said, this one caught my attention due to topic and um, its high rating early on. And I think I looked at it a little bit more carefully when I started culling the things I was subscribed to and decided, you know what, uh, no. And I, 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 I fear I made the right decision there. Now, uh, I'm definitely appreciative of someone reaching out and sharing you know, one of their favorite games with me <laughs> in that. Can I dissect this uh, more uh, in a standard fashion rather than giving that gestalt, hey, why this just didn't work for me? And um, I don't know. You know, component-wise, beautiful components. I mean, other than the one misformed wooden piece. Four-sided die, bad choice, always a bad choice. Four-sided dice don't roll well. Uh, the card deck, you know, it's hard to tell because I did one combat. I'm not a big fan of combat card systems. I think it works fine in this. Uh, I don't want it in a war game, but this is so clearly not a war game that, yeah, I don't know what's going on with it, but it gives you this little gamey type uh, uh, means of playing things out and making guesses. And it actually works well enough solitaire. Uh, the events, it's hard to say here because I got almost none. Um, but yeah, we get, uh, a lot of them are just giving each player a thing. Um, I, I think they're a cool idea. They kind of shake things up a little bit. There's a lot of cards spent on them. Um, I'm not sure they add enough because I played without them for the most part, just by how things fell apart, fell in. This is perfectly reasonable. Uh, I wish there was something like the coin series. Hey, here are your actions and here's what you do. And really, I think the rules could have been summarized, minus the actions, into a couple of pages and should have been very clearly done so as a, here's the core of the game so you don't have to try to find the important points buried in a paragraph, you know, uh, that really spells everything out very clearly uh, so that you can see it. And then another sheet that gives you the actions and spells them out with a little bit less dross than, than is present generally. Um, some of them are fairly easily expressed, like the create galleys. This is small, you know. Um, yes, they give you an example, but it's not much of one. But some of the others feel like they go into a whole lot of information in the rule book that makes the rule book more bloated. And if you don't care about bloating the rule book that much, at least give us something that uh, functions without such bloat. I have the same problem at work, by the way. Everybody, you know, we operated on very light information with the idea that people would be able to figure stuff out and somehow hired a bunch of new people who <laughs> seem to have, uh, you know, what it may just be is that they have the willingness to put their foot down and say, what am I supposed to do here instead of Figure it out, man. You know, if you get it a little wrong, it's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll let it boil down and eventually you'll get used to it. But people who've been there for, for a while are still, you know, not, not as long as I have, but are still like, no, I need this absolutely spelled out. And I hate that because now I have to wade through, just like with these rule books, all this information to try to find the one little piece that is actually important and that we've made a major, you know, a, a major stance on one way or another and flips around a little bit. It's really hard, hard to deal with with that. And similarly here, to find those exceptional cases or whatever, I have to wade through, you know, 
three, four examples on some of these. Wow. That's... <laughs> it's better than the last thing I did, where the rules were actually held in the examples, but... Oh... Yeah, I get the feeling that if they put out, you know, instead of putting out, say, 20 pages of full-color rules with lots of examples in it, if they put out, like, a six-page rule book with just the rules, people would say, oh, it's too simple. You know? <laughs> I don't know. Um, and in addition, it would be helpful if this, instead of giving you lots and lots of examples and pictures, uh, gave you some motivation of why you would be doing these things and how you would play. None of that whatsoever. No, no concept um, towards what you should be doing and, and what things kind of work. And I find something like that is very helpful when you're first facing a, a design. Because that's one of the layers that I found problematic right away, which is the, okay, Maybe this is an incredibly subtle and exciting design. How are you going to get me into it? You know? Uh, if I'm playing and I blunder along and I starve all my people and lose everything I gained, I'm going to be a little discouraged. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not, because that's exactly the kind of thing that excited the hell out of me about 18xx when I first saw it. Or maybe I'm a different person now. Um... What about the actual mechanisms in play? You know, they're not that complicated, to tell you the truth. Uh, it's what emerges from them. And like with Eklund games or whatever, I feel like some degree of, yeah, you should try this out, you know? And you'll draw ideas based on, on things from that uh, is, is kind of helpful to me. Although those games, well, it depends on the game. Uh, let's just put it that way. Uh, the Lords of the Sierra Madre, the Lords series, worked pretty well without having to have too much. In fact, the big debate there was, how am I winning the game? <laughs> you know, there's expressed victory conditions, and then there's like, well, you can consider yourself a winner if you do this instead. <laughs> like, that's such a cool concept, where, you know... Yeah, there's a formal victory, but there's also all these other things. I don't feel like a, a game as abstract as this can express that kind of thing. I got all of Greece on my side, but then I lost it because they all starved to death. But they don't even die. They just... They leave you because you're not creating a socialist utopia for them or something. <coughs> uh, I, I have no idea. Um... So what about the, hey, you can play as long as you want, and then once you pass, uh, the other person then has to start paying a penalty. I think that mechanism seems fine. I like the idea of the penalty, actually. It felt like it was too rich uh, to be able to drive the other person to pass, and then be able to do as many things as I wanted entirely. So I think that that is a, a reasonable balance there, and I, I think it works kind of nicely. The initial starting positions look like they give Athens an advantage. Now, um, what we saw is that certainly can be overcome. I don't understand why, uh, and that's, that's a sign that I shouldn't be doing this video, right? Because I don't know why I lost the game so badly as Athens, or why Sparta won so, uh, you know, was so far in advance. I can't point to that. Um, the game is so disassociated that I'm just kind of like, stuff happened and somehow it changed. Um, and that disassociation is probably my biggest single gripe, is if I can't look back and understand, uh, well, there's either a flaw in me, which I'm sure there are many, but there's also a flaw in terms of being able to make that link, that hook to say what's going on and why it's happening. And it's just not showing in my head. Uh, and I don't know whose it would. <laughs> Unless you've studied the game as an abstract and why did you get into it? Yeah, okay. If it was so obscure. Oh, I don't know. Um,
the creation of forces. I'm a little weird about this. So, obviously some of your population is going into the military, and I understand why you convert population into military. But the truth of the matter is, males who are, uh, uh, trying to find the right word here and it's just not coming to me, progenetically, <laughs> um, somewhat superfluous, are what you build your army out of. Um, you wipe out a lot of males and you still can get a good next generation. Um, how long are the periods in this game? I don't know. Again, it doesn't seem all that well linked. So First Peloponnesian War is two rounds and it looks like it's about 15 years. So you're not looking at a generation in, in any case. So what is throwing all this extra grain? Why what happens at the end of the game? Why does throwing a uh, at the end of a round? Why is throwing a bunch of extra grain increasing your population so significantly? Athens can go from one to four. You know <laughs> what's going on there? Well, it may be that you're attracting people and detracting people. In that case, uh, I'm really not at all convinced that your population is is changing to the degree that the game seems to show. And again, maybe it's an abstraction in play, but here we're cutting cutting those those ribbons that help tie the game to any kind of sense of what is happening uh, with this role. Similarly, maybe more so with the galleys. You think galleys and merchants um, require that much of an expenditure of population? Doesn't feel like it to me. Uh, the cost and prestige for military actions. What's up with that? Oh, I've kind of jumped around. Let's go back uh, to the projects. The projects make sense to me. I'm expending certain resources to get something that, you know, excess resources to get something that is primarily a victory point uh, situation. That's a familiar concept, and I... I you know, have no real gripes about that. So let's go to the military action. The concept of military actions costing you a prestige to do, maybe. Uh, the more volatile, uh, the more disruptive you're being, uh, the less other people see you properly. However, prestige is just victory points. So... It doesn't really serve any sort of world opinion position for diplomacy, but let's let that pass. Uh, the movement, very, very fluid. You can pretty much pass through any territories uh, without being encumbered as long as the enemy's not blocking your way. Uh, I find that refreshing and interesting. If there wasn't a whole hell of a lot else going on that was new and different, uh, that would definitely be something that intrigued me. When you glue too many newish things together, it starts to, again, become less and less understandable, comprehensible as a game. What's it, what's it representing here? Uh, move galleys, same kind of rules there. Besieging uh, a polis makes sense to me. Uh, I feel like the rules for that work kind of well. Um, that there's a fixed defensive strength to a location. Although, honestly, if your population is low enough in, in the polis, maybe it shouldn't be quite as defensible as it would be. Uh, and maybe your home troops should have to be defending it, although they don't have that position. They're always out in the, in, in, in the territories. So then we start to think, well, wait, maybe the population that you're using is just your military age men, and the one person is your police, uh, your officials, and the people necessary to man the walls. Okay, but smaller walls require less people to man them, even though they are automatically destroyed. But 
whatever. As we try to reach for what kind of meaning there is to these population numbers. Because they don't seem to be the actual population of the city. Um, although that's what the rules, a reading of the rules would make them feel like, right? Especially in a game that's dealing with trade and, and these major, you know, establishment of major uh, prestigious events and stuff like that. Eh, it feels like they should be that way, but again, the game gives so little explanation of what it means. There's no designer's notes about what how it links to the reality or anything along those lines. So again, it becomes an abstract uh, that is far too complicated for an abstract from my point of view. Um, collecting tribute. Okay, so what's nice about this is this kind of allows you to represent the situation where uh, the Spartan army marches out and basically takes all the grain from the Athenians. But... <laughs> it doesn't represent the reality very well. Because there's almost no grain in Athens. And that was the main thing they were doing, was cutting uh, the capability of Athens to supply its own people, not its whole, uh, not its whole organizational, you know, not, not the whole coalition, uh, its own people with grain so that they had to use their shipping to get it. And then there's the silver mines, which were essentially untouchable and were protected, uh, which Sparta can take. Um, and I assume there's equally disturbing balances here as well, that the historical elements are not well represented here. Um, what about as a game element? Well, again, I, I really can't talk to it as a game. Um, you know, if it's an unrelated to reality abstraction, uh, it's going to take a whole lot more uh, grasp of how the game plays and what it's doing. A level at which I'm just not willing to play this thing because it doesn't have that hook to draw me in for that, that complexity. There's too much complexity for an abstract for me to be drawn into it. Um, the political actions. Trade. I kind of like the concept of the trade system here, but again, it doesn't represent reality. Uh, Everything's not kind of available everywhere, which it kind of would be, um, with relative prices between each pairing. Instead, what you have is, oh look, the only things I can get through trade are grain and silver. In some ways, that's fair, because... Hold on. Uh, okay. Got a GMT shipment there. Something that I ordered that I probably shouldn't I don't have enough life left in me to play everything I got already, but eh, it's a system that people have been suggesting to me. Uh, Twilight in the East. Uh, I got this Serbian one. Okay. At least I assume that's what came. <laughs> so, the silver can be exchanged for other things. Uh, it can be used in place of almost any other material except for grain. Grain is the one thing you can't exchange. You can't just say silver is grain. And that's especially important, and I missed this in the first time I played it, that's especially important at the end of the turn when you have to feed your people. You can't eat the silver and you're not able to just convert silver to grain. So you got to work to get the grain supply that you need for your population. And if you don't have it, you have to let some members of your, um, of your coalition go. And if you can't get it for your main capital, you lose. <laughs> but um, the importance of not expanding larger than the grain that you can um, produce is not really hinted at in the rules. And again, I had to play one time to get that key concept. One which will lose you the game 
the first time you play it, absolutely if you don't have it, right? <laughs> if you play without realizing that you have to keep your grain in hand, you're expending resources and effort doing things to expand your coalition or whatever, and then you realize, wow, I can't feed everybody. Obscurantism <laughs> in action. Um, the concept that as Athens you would have to be feeding Macedonia if they're allied to you is at the very least not maintaining some sort of supply line where they whereby they could get food. Uh, most cities could feed themselves. That's the first problem. I, I don't think, I think Athens was capable of feeding itself as long as its wheat fields weren't destroyed every fucking year, <laughs> you know? Um, so that whole concept feels alien and wrong. And again, by not meeting expectations historically uh, and making that such a big part of play, I'm just left with this, okay, what the hell is this about? What about the Proxenos? Um, someone tells me I should definitely be using that more. Um, I don't really see that. It seems cheaper to gain things using your military than to gain, because there's this pattern, okay? And again, this may be very naive, but the Proxenos, you pay silver, you pay a lot of silver, and you get control of a polis that way. And that gives you some prestige. There's, you know, so you're paying silver for, for prestige and getting a polis, whatever that means at that point. <clears throat> getting a polis could be very important on the last turn of the game for victory conditions, but earlier on, you're gonna have to pay grain for those people in the polis. So it's less, less of a clear thing. But the big advantage that I see is there's this mech, there's this little pattern um, that applies in the game. And again, this isn't spelled out, but maybe it makes sense of, no, it doesn't, uh, of move your army to a location, besiege the location in there, succeed in taking it. That gets you some prestige, but you paid two, you've paid two prestige minimum to do this already. Pay a third prestige and get resources from that location. Okay, and then those resources will allow you to do other things that may allow you to increase your prestige. Now, if you're looking at a one or two region, this is a loss, a net loss in prestige. If you're looking at a three region, you're breaking even, assuming you succeed in your siege on the first die roll. That's a 50-50 chance. If you're looking at a four region, you've only got a one in four chance of succeeding that way, so you're probably better off using the Proxenos, and that was the one use that we had of a Proxenos, was in the only four region that was taken in my playthrough. Syracuse was not worth taking. And the problem with the Proxenos is, if I use the Proxenos, Let's say I grab this. It costs me eight silver, I get four prestige. Not a great payoff in prestige. Uh, you get a better payoff from whatever the hell they're called, the projects. But for converting silver to prestige. Of course, other actions will let you convert, uh, attacking stuff allows you to convert and create. Um, prestige from prestige, but we've already talked about the balance there. It doesn't come out until you hit the three and you gotta get a 50-50 chance. But you get other resources with it too. But here's the thing, I move my Proxenos there, I pay. So I've taken two actions. I've paid, I hope nothing to get there, although I may have to pay bribes and silver to get there. And then I pay twice the population to get the, the location. And I get half that. I get half that back as prestige. Okay, but I don't have an army here. I still have to move my army. That costs me a prestige and pay a prestige to get the, the resources out of it. So, you know, if I'm talking about getting this for prestige and assuming I want to get the resources too, I'm talking about paying eight silver for two prestige net plus whatever resources I get. 
is that horrible in terms of game terms? No, I mean, you can build your engine in this game. I, I w I've been able to show that an engine can be built. Hey, Sparta won, you know? They must have been doing something at least not too wrong. Uh, and, and yeah, so that's that's uh, what you do with the proxy. So you have to be a little careful, it might get taken over. Again, I have no real problem with this, and the idea of the bribery and everything makes sense. It just... It seems kind of like this disconnected stuff that makes some sense. Like I said before, the battles themselves are handled with these battle cards where somebody puts something, the attacker has the advantage for whatever reason. Okay. <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, the attacker's kind of just the person who has the advantage. Like, the term attacker doesn't seem right. It's actually just the person who has the advantage on that kind of terrain. So if it's on land, Sparta has the advantage of being the attacker, whatever that means, and uh, at sea, Athens has that advantage. And all that means is they get to play cards and say, match these or lose something, right? It's a fine system. Um, the terms seem disconnected from the reality again, like so many things in this game. Uh, you're able to stop the combat from happening by just paying a prestige, uh, which doesn't go to anyone, I think. I think you just lose it. See, it says one player decides to retreat and pays one prestige for his cowardice to his opponent. If you word it the way I just said it, it sounds like the prestige goes to the opponent. If you word it as pays one prestige for his cowardice to his opponent, it sounds like I just pay one prestige. It, it, that prestige... The reason for that prestige is the cowardice to my opponent, as opposed to one prestige for my cowardice, comma, which isn't present, to his opponent. Again, am I splitting hairs? Maybe, but the rule book is written poorly enough and in an in a informal enough style that those kind of ambiguities do show up. I played it at, I didn't use it. But I was assuming I just throw that prestige away, and that was a bad enough cost that I didn't want to do it because I still had to pay more prestige to get out of a situation that would be combat, uh, that would require combat, perhaps. Um, but reading this again, I'm thinking that I misread that, that they meant for that comma to be there. Uh, it would be pretty unambiguous if there was a comma comma there between cowardice and to his opponent. Or if it were reworded to pays one prestige to his opponent for his cowardice. That would also be unambiguous, right? But no, the way it's worded, it's... I took it the other way. Uh, that's just an example of how these rules are. Uh, and it's probably answered on BGG or something, and I probably have it absolutely wrong the way I played it, because I am guessing that they wouldn't have used all those words if they didn't mean it the way I didn't play it. Uh, and then the end of round stuff, you buy off the projects, that's normal. Having to feed all your people. Again, I feel like this is just fucking weird, because what you're essentially doing is collecting up all the grain that you can get from your tributaries and then giving it back to them. And that just ain't the way things worked, you know? But this is the core mechanism of this weird abstract game that doesn't relate to what it purports to relate to. And again, the growth, that can't be the real population, so what's the grain causing you to do? I don't know, a handout class, a welfare state? I, I, I don't, that's easily transmitted like the unemployed are in, uh, <laughs> in After the Holocaust. Is that what you're creating? Again, it's not clear, it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it sure the hell is not ancient Greece. The megalopolis gets something bigger than it started and you get one prestige from it. I don't know, maybe, you know? <laughs> I really don't know. Um, Size certainly has a prestige with it, but turning a tiny little hamlet into a slightly bigger village 
doesn't seem like and, and or you were given a, t a a little village and not letting it decrease back to a tiny little hamlet doesn't seem like something worth prestige in particular if what the population means is a large class of uh unemployed people which is kind of an explanation that I'm looking at for it, uh, who is requiring a, 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 a grain doll in order to not join the military or something. I mean, why don't you have to feed your military? That seems like they need food more than the people in the city, and you need to deliver it to them. Again, I don't know what this game represents. And then uh, a cost for maintaining certain perishable goods. Hey, that makes sense, but again, with how disassociated everything else is, who knows? Uh, trading prestige for silver, I actually used that at the end of the game. Uh, some mechanical tasks between rounds, and then uh, how you lose the game, basically. Which for the most part is if your prestige gets too low, zero at certain points um yeah basically zero or negative is what's going to kill you uh, uh, and if you really fuck up with your grain and have too big a population in your home city that could be a problem too everything else you can let loose uh if you otherwise the game goes to its end and you count up victory points of uh, this combination of population, which is generally not a good thing, but in certain places it's kind of cool to have it larger because you're not paying a lot for the victory points you're getting off of it. And, and, and this is the thing. So, like, it, if you're Athens or Sparta, it's not a good thing to be getting Athens and Sparta as the megalopolis here. What's good is to have tiny little dipshit town uh, be twice its size and be a village, and, uh, or a tiny little hamlet be a village instead. <laughs> you know, that's how you score prestige off this game, is you spread your population among little things and kind of hold on to those little things. And again, that this... What the fuck is that supposed to mean? The real prestige in this would be that Athens or Sparta is an important city and not um, that it has a lot of moderately better off villages associated with it. <laughs> you know, but whatever. Um, I, again, I don't mind the projects. I think that they work reasonably according to expectations from other games. Um, okay, so if you're a Euro player and you've made it this far, you're saying, what the fuck is this dude going on about? <laughs> and you're right. Um, I don't understand your world any more than you understand mine. I really don't. Uh, what I look for in a game, though, doesn't mean that I'm anti all Euros. So, there are some that I've taken a great deal of, wow, that links in a reasonable sort of way. I understand the connection there. Um, one example where that, uh, you know, there, there are plenty of examples of Euros that I've rated highly uh, and, and, and reviewed, probably in equally uh, nonsensical terms to this, but my feeling is that this is an abstract game that should have never been packaged with a thematic layer over it because it doesn't really do it. You know, it doesn't really try. It's hard to associate and figure out what it means. The best it is is window dressing that appears uh, for that. And for me, that's a... Uh, a barrier which makes the game almost unplayable, unlearnable. There might be a fantastic set of decision making in this game, but that barrier of the um, of the reality that it's representing is enough for me to not be able to approach it easily. Now, there are games that are pure abstracts that I can enjoy a great deal and that have a lot of subtlety to them, but that subtlety is emergent, not from a bunch of complex things that are all kind of tangled together and you have to untangle them. That style of Euro, I do not like. Um, 
the intuitive decision making has to ma and, and matching of you know what you'd expect with a knowledge of the history and whatever has to kind of match what uh, what you're going to get from the abstractions that a game necessarily has to impose to be playable. Uh, where those where those do match, and they lead you to right decisions or at least defensible decisions, <laughs> right? Then I'm fairly happy. I feel like I learned somebody's uh, understanding and uh, model for the universe at one time, and, you know, in, within certain constraints, whatever. Here, I don't have that, and I have a level of complexity that is only defensible, in my view, by something that is providing some kind of real model. And this doesn't. When I look at abstracts that I enjoy, they are generally, uh, uh, well, they are almost invariably very simple in the rules. The actual knowledge of what you can and cannot do is very easy. The decision-making process can emerge as a more complex thing, but this one, no. Nah. This feels like it's trying to represent something and does not, to me, seem to align at all with reality. That doesn't mean I wouldn't enjoy it. Um, it is po I took more enjoyment on video than I would uh, than I was playing it uh, without the video, because at least I get to gripe some more about stuff. Uh, and I also make decisions a little quicker on video than I do in reality. Uh, playing it opposed, I could see, uh, you know, if you were with someone who really likes this game and, you know, really likes some of the ideas to it, I could see that being infectious or whatever. But on my own, I just look at it and I say, you know, it's like this, this spiky thing that I don't know what's inside of it. People tell me it might be yummy, but every time I touch it, it hurts. And I just don't think that I would go for it. <laughs> uh, maybe seeing someone do some really amazing stuff would eventually get me hooked into it in the way that, you know, simpler euros that have equally, that have definite, subtle, and, and, and emergent uh, interactions would appeal to me more, or that something that, you know, is actually trying to model something to some degree. This, yeah, I, I don't see why, I don't see why anybody, uh, I don't see why anybody was drawn into it. You know, that's, that's the real thing. Not that there might not be something under there. I don't know it well enough to be able to tell you that. I would have to play it, you know, quite a few times to start to see and against maybe people who know what they're doing and whatnot to have any feeling. And why? You know, there are plenty of other games out there that draw you in a lot quicker. All right, up it goes.